Merhaba sevgili dostlar ben Mixyap.com'dan Emre Aşevik. Bildiğiniz gibi analog ve dijital kavgası hiçbir zaman bitmiyor. Dijitalin köşeli olduğunu düşünen cahil insanlar var. Ben de bunun önüne geçebilmek için zamanında zaten bu konuyu kapatmış bir videonun, bir testin, bir laboratuvar testinin altyazısını ekledim ve size sunuyorum. Videoyu dikkatlice seyredin. Umarım bu konuyla ilgili bir daha böyle saçma bir muhabbet duymayız. Gelin videoya birlikte bakalım. Hi, I'm Monty Montgomery from Red Hat and Ziff.org. A few months ago, I wrote an article on digital audio and why 24-bit, 192 kHz music downloads don't make sense. In the article, I mentioned, almost in passing, that a digital waveform is not a stair step, and you certainly don't get a stair step when you convert from digital back to analog. Of everything in the entire article, that was the number one thing people wrote about. In fact, more than half the mail I got questions and comments about basic digital signal behavior. Since there's interest, let's take a little time to play with some simple digital signals. Pretend for a moment that we have no idea how digital signals really behave. In that case, it doesn't make sense for us to use digital test equipment either. Fortunately for this exercise, there's still plenty of working analog lab equipment out there. First up, We need a signal generator to provide us with analog input signals, in this case, an HP 3325 from 1978. It's still a pretty good generator, so if you don't mind the size, the weight, the power consumption, and the noisy fan, you can find them on eBay, occasionally, for only slightly more than you'll pay for shipping. Next, we'll observe our analog waveforms on analog oscilloscopes like this, Tektronix 2246 from the mid-90s, one of the last and very best analog scopes ever made. Every home lab should have one. And finally, inspect the frequency spectrum of our signals using an analog spectrum analyzer, this HP3585, from the same product line as the signal generator. Like the other equipment here, it has a rudimentary and hilariously large microcontroller, but the signal path from input to what you see on the screen is completely analog. All of this equipment is vintage, but aside from its raw tonnage, the specs are still quite good. At the moment, we have our signal generator set to output a nice 1 kilohertz sine wave at 1 volt RMS. We see the sine wave on the oscilloscope, can verify that it is indeed 1 kilohertz at 1 volt RMS, which is 2.8 volts peak to peak. And that matches the measurement on the spectrum analyzer as well. The analyzer also shows some low level white noise and just a bit of harmonic distortion with the highest peak about 70 decibels or so below the fundamental. Now, this doesn't matter at all in our demos, but I wanted to point it out now, just in case you didn't notice it till later. Now, we drop digital sampling in the middle. For the conversion, we'll use a boring, consumer-grade eMagic USB-1 audio device. It's also more than 10 years old at this point, and it's getting obsolete. A recent converter can easily have an order of magnitude better specs of flatness, linearity, jitter, noise behavior, everything. You may not have noticed, just because we can measure an improvement doesn't mean we can hear it. And even these old consumer grade boxes were already at the edge of ideal transparency. The eMagic connects to my ThinkPad, which displays a digital waveform and spectrum for comparison. Then the ThinkPad sends the digital signal right back out to the eMagic for reconversion to analog and observation on the output scopes. Input to output, left to right. Okay, it's go time. We begin by converting an analog signal to digital and then right back to analog again with no other steps. The signal generator is set to produce a 1 kilohertz sine wave just like before. We can see our analog sine wave on our input side oscilloscope. We digitize our signal to 16-bit PCM at 44.1 kHz, same as on a CD. The spectrum of the digitized signal matches what we saw earlier and what we see now on the analog spectrum analyzer, aside from its high impedance input being just a smidge noisier. For now, the waveform display shows our digitized sine wave as a stair-step pattern, one step for each sample, and when we look at the output signal that's been converted from digital back to analog, we see it's exactly like the original sine wave, no stair steps. 
Okay, 1 kilohertz is still a fairly low frequency. Maybe the stair steps are just hard to see, or they're being smoothed away. Fair enough. Let's choose a higher frequency, something close to Nyquist, say 15 kilohertz. Now the sine wave is represented by less than three samples per cycle, and the digital waveform looks pretty awful. Well, looks can be deceiving. The analog output is still a perfect sine wave, exactly like the original. Let's keep going up. Let's see if I can do this without blocking any cameras. 16 kilohertz. 17 kilohertz. 18 kilohertz. 19 kilohertz. 20 kilohertz. 20 Welcome to the upper limits of human hearing. The output waveform is still perfect. No jagged edges, no drop-off, no stair steps. So, where'd the stair steps go? Don't answer, it's a trick question. They were never there. Drawing a digital waveform as a stair step was wrong to begin with. Why? A stair step is a continuous time function. It's jagged, and it's piecewise, but it has a defined value at every point in time. A sampled signal is entirely different. It's discrete time. It's only got a value right at each instantaneous sample point, and it's undefined. There is no value at all everywhere in between. A discrete time signal is properly drawn as a lollipop graph. The continuous analog counterpart of a digital signal passes smoothly through each sample point, and that's just as true for high frequencies as it is for low. Now the interesting, and not at all obvious bit is, there's only one band-limited signal that passes exactly through each sample point. It's a unique solution, so if you sample a band-limited signal and then convert it back, the original input is also the only possible output. And before you say, oh, I can draw a different signal that passes through those points, well, yes, you can, but... <clears throat> If it differs even minutely from the original, it contains frequency content at or beyond Nyquist, breaks the band limiting requirement, and isn't a valid solution. So how did everyone get confused and start thinking of digital signals as stair steps? I can think of two good reasons. First, it's easy enough to convert a sampled signal to a true stair step. Just extend each sample value forward until the next sample period. This is called a zero-order hold. And it's an important part of how some digital-to-analog converters work, especially the simplest ones. So, anyone who looks up digital-to-analog converter or digital-to-analog conversion is probably going to see a diagram of a stair-step waveform somewhere. But that's not a finished conversion, and it's not the signal that comes out. Second, and this is probably the more likely reason, engineers who supposedly know better, like me, draw stair-steps, even though they're technically wrong. It's sort of like a one-dimensional version of fat bits in an image editor. Pixels aren't squares, either. They're samples of a two-dimensional function space, and so they're also, conceptually, infinitely small points. Practically, it's a real pain in the ass to see or manipulate infinitely small anything. So big squares it is. Digital stair-step drawings are exactly the same thing. It's just a convenient drawing. The stair-steps aren't really there.